together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come to you, and we come to you grateful. We are happy that we can open the Bible today and share Jesus. I pray that he would be seen, not some speaker person, but Jesus would be seen. Take us on a journey together, Lord, and speak to our hearts. I pray, we pray, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're joining us from afar, I think we've welcomed you, but welcome again. We love the fact that you're with us. I mentioned Stevenson earlier, so g'day Stevenson. And, and uh, uh, Canyonville down s- south of us and the other villes, the other towns, wherever you're joining us from. Gold Beach, we mentioned you earlier. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. A 17th century philosopher once said these wise words. Look at what he said. God denied to men the faculty of flight so that they might lead a quiet and tranquil life. For if they knew how to fly, they would always be in perpetual danger. Seems like a little uh, redundancy there, always perpetual. But nevertheless, that's what a gentleman named Lobkowitz said many years ago. He felt like in God's eyes, it would be better for us if we didn't fly. But that hasn't stopped people from working away at it. It's thought that Leonardo da Vinci designed what has been called an ornithopter, a machine that he figured would enable people to fly. It had flapping wings. It resembled the anatomy of birds. The man who painted the Mona Lisa, not on canvas, but on a poplar plank. The man who created a magnificent work of art, a fresco, really, The Last Supper. It's it's fantastic. That man really was a student of flight. He never flew, but he was a student of, of of that discipline, a student of flying. People been at this for a long time. What da Vinci couldn't do, a couple of bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio did. The Wright brothers. They owned a bicycle shop. They sold bicycles, they repaired bicycles, uh, manufactured bicycles. December 17, 1903, at Kill Devil Hills on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, near Kitty Hawk. They became the first people in the history of the world. I'll get back to that. It is thought, it is is claimed that they became the first people in the history of the world ever to to successfully fly a, a heavier than air aircraft. Now, you come to church to learn. Let me learn you something. It is believed by me and others and others that a fellow named Richard Pierce actually got off the ground before the Wright brothers. But Richard Pierce did this in the days before social media the internet, the telephone, he did it down there at the near the bottom of the world in beautiful New Zealand. South Island of New Zealand, the one that is noted there as the North Island. It's a fact. It's as sure as, well, some people claim, I think it's a fact. I mean, I'm from New Zealand, so what do you expect me to say? You might accuse me of bias, and if you did, I would have to say I'm guilty. But once people got flying, there was no stopping him. Just 24 years after Orville and Wilbur Wright got off the ground in North Carolina, what happened? Charles Lindbergh became the first individual to fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I don't know how you fly across the Atlantic Ocean any other way than nonstop. Where would you stop? But Lindbergh didn't stop. It took him about a day, maybe longer. He flew from New York City to Paris, France, Took him 33 and a half hours. And then just five years later, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to cross the Atlantic Ocean solo. Jets began flying in 1939. Chuck Yeager went faster than the speed of sound in 1947. Yuri Gagarin orbited the earth in 1961. And then John Glenn did in 1962. He did it three times. Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, 1969, 20th day of July. He took one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And now the space shuttle goes up. Well, it doesn't anymore. This, it, that's old hat. Can you imagine? The space shuttle used to go up and come back down. John Glenn went back to space at the age of 77 in 1998 in one of those space shuttles. I mean, what an amazing thing. Now there's space tourism. William Shatner from Star Trek recently boldly went where, well, where plenty of people had gone before. Bless his heart. 
Now they send up rockets that go up and come back down. Land, reuse them. They're talking about sending people to Mars, have been for some time, but it sounds like there's a little seriousness about that now. The question is, how far is this thing going to go? Well, I will tell you, a whole lot further than that, the best is yet to come. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If that were not the case, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. Come on and say amen. Amen. One day. Sorry, Wilbur and Orville, no disrespect. One day. Sorry, Neil Armstrong. One day. Sorry, Elon Musk. One day we're going up, all the way up. We are going to travel through the cosmos, through the starry heavens. We're going all the way to heaven. Amen. I've never been there. Leonardo da Vinci never went there. The Hubble telescope has not ever sent back pictures of or from heaven. But millions and millions of people believe that there is heaven. We've never been. We've never seen photographs. All we have is the word of others who have either seen or been. One of those people being Jesus. There's only ink on paper. We don't have a webcam from heaven. Nothing. So we're taking this by faith. But man, we can take it by faith. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from where? Come on. Heaven. That's right. John the Baptist was convinced. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used the word heaven no less than 18 times. He was adamant about this. In uh, Matthew 10 and verse 32, he referred to my father who is in heaven. Mark 1 verse 11, a voice came from heaven heaven by the way this happened at the baptism of Jesus if you listened carefully during the baptisms you would have heard God say this is my beloved daughter this is my beloved son angels reported that there's a heaven chapter 1 verse 11 of the book of Acts men of Galilee why do you stand here gazing up into heaven I don't need to read the rest of the verse but it's so good I'm going to this same Jesus who tell me all right, all right, I'll tell you, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. There are 27 books in the New Testament. 20 of them mention heaven. Revelation talks about heaven more than 50 times. If there was no heaven, imagine the implications. John Lennon wrote the song, Imagine, Imagine There's No Heaven. He didn't know what he was talking about, of course. But imagine if there wasn't. Can you imagine? Earth would be all you have. I, I, I made a few people nervous the other day when I mentioned that the, the average life expectancy in this country is 79. Now, good news is for Seventh-day Adventists, you are expected to live on average about seven or eight years longer. But then there are some people who blow right by that. I have a friend whose father, an artist, a painter, still painting, he's active and, and raring to go every day at the age of 105. So I'm not trying to bother anybody. But if you imagine there's no heaven, then you have to content yourself with nothing more than your time on this mortal coil. Live, enjoy, or not, and then you're gone. Imagine that. But imagine if there is a heaven. Now we are talking. It means that there is something after this life. Something after this world. Remember Jesus said, in my father's house. He began that speech with the words, let not your heart be troubled. Ah, now let's think about that. Why would he say that? Let not your heart be troubled. He knew that his disciples would encounter difficulty. By the way, they were attached to a man who was an outcast. They had left their jobs to follow him. They met constant opposition. They were reviled. I mean, they followed Jesus, but it did not mean that their life was all roses. There were plenty of thorns. And so Jesus spoke to them and he said, let not your heart be troubled. He knew their lives would become considerably more difficult. Some of them would lose their lives. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Listen, friend, 
I know, you know, God knows that there are difficult times in your life. Might be now. Might have been a diagnosis. Might be some friction in a relationship, even a marriage. Uh, could be some, some health worries. You haven't been diagnosed, but uh, you're a little worried. Could be finances. It could be that your hold on God is just, it's like you're hanging on to a slippery pole. For some reason, it's like there's no traction. You're concerned that it might just be slipping away. Ah, oh, wait. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Thank the Lord we're coming through this pandemic. I'm not trying to count chickens before they're hatched. Thank God uh, new COVID cases in Multnomah County, the numbers are in free fall. Thank God for that. Wouldn't it be great if we can put this behind us? You've been badly affected by the pandemic. God says, let not your heart be troubled. Job loss, let not your heart. doesn't mean to, to, to be silly about the reality of the challenges that you face. Life can be challenging. Jesus isn't saying act like you don't have a brain, but he's saying don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be moved, shaken away from where you need to be. Don't lose confidence. Don't lose faith. Don't start believing that there isn't a tomorrow when there is a bright tomorrow. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He was giving us assurance like when he spoke to the disciples and he said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank the Lord for that. This same Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. No, he said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The famous, it's, it's, they call it the new John 3, 16, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, where God said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. But I'd ask somebody, what's the context of those words being uttered? Who said that? God. Why? When? When did he say that? He said that to his people Israel as they were going into captivity. They were going to Babylon. They were being taken to Babylon. Some of them maybe already have been in Babylon. And God was saying, no, no, no. It's, it's, listen, big picture. It's all right. I know the thoughts I have towards you. I, I have for you a future and a hope. I want to give you an expected end. God says, we are not done yet. The best is ahead. And by the way, between here and the best is a time of trouble coming such as never was. So if you are in the habit of letting your heart be troubled, you're just going to be bumped right out of the arms of Jesus. If you can learn faith and rest and repose and trust and confidence, even when the sea is stormy and the wind is blowing your vessel and the water is getting in the boat and sinking seems imminent. If you can trust, then you've got your hands on Jesus or in Jesus' hands. The best is ahead. Heaven is ahead. One day we're getting out of here and we are going to the place that we can really call home. This earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. Well, does this really work? Does it, does it, does it really work? These Christians, maybe they're just deluded. Is it real? Is it really real? Karl Marx socialist revolutionary maybe maybe was he was he right when he spoke of religion saying religion is the opium of the people marx was saying that faith in god might only provide or he said would only provide an illusory happiness he believed that faith in god was harmful now i would love to be able to tell karl marx this myself but i'm unable to because he sleeps right now Highgate Cemetery in North London in England. I've, I've, I've been to his final resting place. Friend and I, we wandered over to Highgate, took a look around. It was closed. I jumped the fence so I could sneak in there and have a look at Karl Marx's tomb. And as I did, as I did some security guy stepped out into the open and I, I hightailed it out of there. So we know where Karl Marx is. He's dead. He died at the age of 64. He said religion is the opium of the people. Now, Karl Marx is dead, but God is very much alive. Karl, if you could take some of that opium, you would, wouldn't you? You would. Ah, don't bother with Christianity, says a dead man who did not live a long life. It was probably pretty good for that era. God had the final say. I emailed a friend who was battling cancer. Hey, how you doing? Man, it was really interesting. He said, he wrote in reply, there are few things in this world you can really count on. That's what he said. He said, one of them is faith in God. 
and the other is that Jesus died to save sinners. Oh, come on. Now, I know that you just let that by. I know what happens in sermons. You can tune out. You can tune out. But I'm talking about somebody with cancer looking death in the face and able to say, I can count on what? Faith in God and that Jesus died to save sinners. It's like the lady I visited. And, and I said, so how's it going? She said, Pastor, I always tried to get cancer in a part of my body where I had two of something. She said, I lost a kidney. I lost a breast. I lost an eye. She said, but I've only got one liver. I said, liver cancer. She said, yeah. How's it looking? Not good. I said, how are you going to be? She said, she propped herself up in her bed and she said, me and Jesus are going to get through this together. Oh, come on. And that's exactly what happened. She died. I spoke at a funeral. Well, one day soon, she's going to open her eyes and come out to grave. She's going to say, it was worth it. It's all right. We got through it together. And she will forever be in a land that is fairer than day. Even when life is slipping away, you can say, it's all right. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he's got me. When we enter the abode of the redeemed, we are not going to think back on our hardships. We just say, hallelujah. God was right. Christ is Lord. It's all right. Heaven is cheap enough. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, what we need is help. We are human beings. We're broken. We're all broken. Don't tell me you're not. You are. Don't pretend that I'm not. I am. We're all broken. Every last one of us. We, we, we read sometimes even about high profile people who fall and we, you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's, of course it's sad. And we don't want to, we don't want to give people a free pass for their, their, their error or their stupidity or their lack of judgment or whatever it might've been in a given situation. But I'm way past the point of pointing the finger because I understand that there, but for the grace of God go I, but here's the good news. God can save the weak. In fact, he can't save anybody but the weak. There is hope for you if you're faulty because Jesus came into this world not to save the strong, but to save sinners. Paul was praying. He had a burden. He prayed repeatedly that God would remove the thorn in his flesh. God didn't. But God spoke to Paul and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now that's a phenomenal thing. My strength, he went on to say, is made perfect in what? Weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. So if you can learn to bring your weakness to God, then and only then you can begin to experience the strength of God. If you're blustering your way through life, pretending you've got it all together and you want to bring God your strength, think again. Somebody wrote on good authority that Solomon was never so great or so wise as when he said, I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. So in order to get to heaven, all you need to be is weak. How about that? Any weak people here today? Oh, probably. Well, definitely. So if you can be weak, you can be saved. That's great news. That means that all of us can look forward to heaven. We're not celebrating our weakness, except that we can say, thank the Lord. If it takes weakness to get to heaven, I've got that in great quantities. God can do something with that. His strength is made perfect in weakness. If you're trying to be good enough to go to heaven, you've got to disabuse yourself of that approach to life. If you're trying to, uh, trying to get to the place where, I think God can save me now. No, no, no. It's like trying to make water go uphill. Here is what God offers us. Follow me now. We're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we have no confidence in the flesh. People in Paul's day wanted to rely on the works of the flesh to, 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 to believe or to merit salvation. The stronger I am, the holier I am, the more publicly uh, a pious I can possibly be, the more saved I'm going to be. But Paul says we just cannot trust in the flesh. No confidence at all. Now he wrote about circumcision in the context. He wasn't just talking about that. Any works of the flesh, we cannot trust in them in order to earn or merit or deserve salvation. We just cannot. So what do we do about this? Paul says in verse 4, Philippians 3 and verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. I could. 
If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Wow. What makes Paul so high and mighty? Verse 5, he begins to tell us, circumcised the eighth day, right day, of the stock of Israel, right nation, of the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Israel's first king, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. All right. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, and those guys were rigid in the way they kept the law. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he says, blameless. And not too many people can say that. I did it all. If there was a work that needed to be worked, I worked it. If there was a deed that needed to be done, I did it. This was Paul. I had qualifications if that's what you were looking for for heaven. But, he says, none of that was going to help me at all. In fact, the exact opposite was true. Look in verse 7. What things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Why would they be loss? Verse 8, he tells us. Yes, indeed, or yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as, the King James says, dung. New King James here is a little more uh, polite company. Rubbish, refuse, that I may gain Christ. Without Jesus, my works are meritless. They're useless. They're unhelpful. They may even be a hindrance because I may rely on them. And then he states his great desire in verse 9. I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. By faith, you just heard something utterly transformational. If you didn't realize it, pinch yourself, sit up, and go, oh, what, what did I miss? Paul is saying, all my works don't need them. They're dung. They're manure. They're no good. They're worth nothing. But, but what I want is to be found in Christ, in Christ, surrendered to him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God. And I can have that... By faith, you can't buy it, you can't earn it, you never deserve it, but you can believe it. And when you do, you say, that's mine. I have God's righteousness. We talked about some of that in question time earlier. Now that I have his righteousness, that's absolute perfect righteousness, and it's mine. And God, when he looks at me, sees that, and I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing in the grace of God. I have his righteousness. Amazing to have such incredible righteousness but that's what God offers us and promises us it's the only righteousness you can have if you want to get into heaven self righteousness doesn't cut it how do we have it easy we have it by faith when God takes your sin he gives you his righteousness and you know it by faith you believe it can you believe that? Of course you can believe that. You believed in a tooth fairy once? That wasn't true. You believed in Santa Claus once? Ah, you learned. You believed in a hundred different things. You, you believed this, so many things. And you say, oh, but here's one thing you can believe. That when you claim the righteousness of God, it's yours. And you have it by faith. It's easy to feel like a failure as a Christian. Largely because we have had so much practice at failing. And we continue to stumble, some of us, more than we really need to or should. Professional golfer Bryson DeChambeau was playing in, was it the Wells Fargo? Charlotte, North Carolina. After two holes, he, sorry, two rounds, and that's where they, they, when, the, when the cut is imposed. He looked at his score and he said, I'm never going to make the cut. 65 players would make the cut. He was 90th. He said, I'm 25 out. I'm not going to make the cut. Got in a plane, flew back to Texas. Well, hello. Things changed. His score ended up being pretty solid. So many players shot lesser rounds that he ended up making the cut. So the next morning at 2.45 a.m., he got back on a plane, flew to Charlotte, North Carolina, on virtually no sleep, grabbed a rental car, drove straight to the course, hit the ball a few times, and went out on the course. Things didn't go so bad. And by the time the golf tournament had finished, the next day, he finished ninth and took home something like 
$229,000. Not bad for getting cut. Ended in the top 10. You see, people make that mistake in their lives. You look in the mirror, you go, I blew it. I screwed up. I ruined things. I'm not really a Christian. I ought to quit. Oh, forget that. You ought to just grab hold of Jesus. I don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. The sooner you come to terms with that, the better off you'll be. I'm not good enough. That's why you need Jesus. Because he is good enough. He's the only one who's good enough. And you grab him. And God looks at you and sees Jesus. There you go. Pretty simple. That's settled. You had a bad day. Hey. Grab Jesus. Hang on to Jesus. Do it in sincerity. Don't do it in presumption. God will change your heart and grow your life and change your heart and grow your life. What did Jesus say in Mark 2 and verse 17? All very interesting words. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you give up, what does that prove? You're just out the game. If every golfer who had a bad round quit, there'd be no golfers left. They'd all give it up. For the Christian, you got to know that Jesus doesn't give up on you. And Jesus will live his life in you. Rough day, hang on to Jesus. You stumbled again, learn from that. Learn from that. And hold on tight to Jesus and let him grow you. And believe that through faith in Christ, you have everlasting life. Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So where does that leave that, oh, well, what's wrong with, I'm going to heaven, so what's, no, you know, you don't ask those questions. Wouldn't this be okay? What's wrong with that? Isn't a little just okay? That's not Christianity, man. You don't do that in your marriage. Spouse says, don't fool around. You say, isn't a little okay? No, 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 fool around with that stuff. This is God we're talking about. You want him to have your whole heart. You're going to believe. You're going to read. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy, all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And over here you're going to say, oh man, isn't a little okay? Uh, can I just get away with? Yeah, let's resolve that. You want Jesus to take all of your heart, live his life in you, and remake you. You just want to surrender to Jesus. Not let someone else occupy the throne of your heart. Only Jesus. Not you. Only Jesus. Not the devil, trust in the Lord. Uh, again, I, I mentioned this earlier. I'll breeze over this a little more quickly. What we don't want to factor out about Christian experience is growth. Many people claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then they stumble and they bumble and they bumble and they stumble. Like, ah, forgetting that a redwood tree takes hundreds and hundreds of years to mature. Forgetting that Rome wasn't built in a day. For, forgetting that. Things take time, even your spiritual growth. Your salvation doesn't take any time at all. That's a decision. But you look in the mirror and you see a sinner. Well, yeah, but you're growing. Just hang on to Jesus. Grow, grow, grow a little more. Keep reading the Bible. These people are like, well, I'm such a sinner. Do you read the Bible? No. What do you expect? Oh, I struggle with sin. Oh, do you pray? Oh, maybe for about a minute. You're going to keep struggling. So come, come into communion with God. Just take time. Sit down. Read that book, man. Oh, I struggle with Ezekiel. Turn over to John. Turn to Acts. Turn to Romans. Oh, I struggle with Romans 5. Go to Romans 6. You can't struggle with that. Go to Romans 8. Boom. It's like dynamite. And so we go to God in spite of our weaknesses. And we grow. I want you to see what Paul said. Same author. When he wrote to the church in Rome, he said, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. Consider yourself dead to sin. I should have put that in question time earlier. You got it? First thing, that's sin. Cons believe that you're dead to it. That's really important. Then verse 16. Power, man. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or obedience under righteousness. We want to be holy. We want to be saved. We want to have the righteousness of Jesus. We claim it by faith. And we surrender. We yield. We yield. You, you, can't, you, you can't will the imperfections out of your life. The sin out of your life. You yield to God. He will drive them out. Prayer and fasting. Good. We ought to do that. But the key is Christ 
and faith in Christ and surrender to Jesus Christ. Someone cuts you off in traffic. God's going to say, surrender. Ah, you surrender. And then it gets easier next time. Somebody backs into your car in a parking lot. You want to yell. No, you don't. Jesus, take my mouth. Take my, calm me down. I surrender to you. And now you can be like, ah, oh, I'm glad you have insurance. We can get this taken care of. God makes your vocal cords a channel of blessing. That's what he does. Send a prayer to God. Peter did. He was sinking. What did he do? He cried out, Lord, save me. He was sinking. You start sinking. Hair on your neck starts rise. Veins start boom. Send out that prayer. Lord, save me. And he'll save you. That's what he does. You do it every time. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We looked at it earlier. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it just powerful we surrender sin attacks surrender whatever the battle might be surrender jesus brings his powerful presence and his righteousness into your life you surrender you 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 fail turn the page yield again turn the page yield again that's what growing is all about when you were a child and you were learning to walk you've spent more time on your derriere than on your feet did you come to the place where you said, oh, forget it, I just won't walk. I'll crawl for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. You fell, you got up. Let Jesus pick you up. You can't go a day without smoking. Go a minute. Just go a minute. And they go, well, can, can God enable me to go another minute and another minute? Can I do this leaning on Jesus? This is what happens. Jesus described the work of the gospel in a parable as being like seed that is sown. And it comes up first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Growth. Yield and grow. And believe that God gives you his righteousness because that is precisely what God does. Now we talk about heaven. Three heavens. There are three heavens. One, the Bible says, where the birds fly. That's the heavens. Birds fly in the heavens. Another heaven is where the stars are. Space. That's referred to in the Bible as heaven. And the other, the other heaven is where God lives. Heaven. Three heavens. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God's dwelling place. We're going to go to a physical place, an actual place, a real place. And we go there when Jesus comes back to take us there. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Powerful. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. With the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming back to be our tour guide. And take us on a journey like you never had before what a magnificent reunion children will see their parents again grandparents again parents will see their children again we'll see friends family acquaintances former church members we're going to see it all can you imagine those reunions death was 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 never meant to be you go to graveyard you see those little gravestones on teeny tiny graves children born here Parents are going to see their children again. Grandparents are going to see their grandchildren again. And parents are going to see their moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas again. It's, it's going to happen. And eternity stretches before us. We have heaven to enjoy forever. The, the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise. What a day. Jesus challenges our thinking in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. I mean, Paul wrote these words. As it's written... I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Paul borrowed that from the prophet Isaiah, who wrote those words in Isaiah chapter 64. Let's take a moment to imagine what heaven's going to be like. Can you imagine? It'll be better than that. What's your wildest dreams? Better than that. Most beautiful place you've been to? Better than that. New Zealand. Better than that. I mean, see how good it is. Better than that. It's going to be better. 
better. You never get bored. You'll never wish you were somewhere else. You'll never be sitting there listening to the preacher thinking, I wish he would end. You never think that. Not in heaven. You never have that experience. You never have a dull moment. You'll always be fulfilled. You'll always be thrilled and blessed. Better than the best vacation. Better than your dream home. Better than the best place you've ever been. Uh, Best of all, Jesus is there. You're in the presence of God. So it's not like you just go to some heavenly Hawaii. It, it's better than anything you could even dream because there you are with God himself. John wrote in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And immediately, he said, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. He saw God in Daniel 7. Daniel saw God, the ancient of days, whose hair was white as snow. The, uh, who, who, who's, I, I listened to, that this, listened to that this morning during my devotional time. The hair on his head were like the pure world. His, and anyway, I should be able to recite that, and I just got stumbled. There's God. Daniel saw him. His clothing is white as snow. Hair pure as wool. His thrown like a fiery flame. Wheels as burning fire. Great multitudes in heaven. Undoubtedly. An amazing place. Would you want to be anywhere else? Would you want to compromise your ability to be there with God? Revelation eleven nineteen says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments inside, reminding us the relevance, the importance, the vitalness of the Ten Commandments. They're as important now as ever. What's Jesus doing? He's in heaven. What's he doing there? In Hebrews chapter 8. Some folks have been studying about this recently. Hebrews 8 verse 1. There's the Ten Commandments. But we go to Hebrews now. We have such an high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. What's Jesus doing there? A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected in heaven. You have a lawyer. His name is Jesus. He's an advocate. He's your mediator. See, see, he says, I know you're going to blow it. So come to me. I'll take care of that. I know you're going to have problems. So come to me. I'll help you deal with that. That's what he says. Why wouldn't we come? God help me. Take my heart. Yes, we're guilty when we show up at heaven's courtroom except that we are declared righteousness as righteous as we have allowed Jesus to take our sins this earth is heaven's focus can you imagine how vast this universe is every now and then I, I saw a picture the other day taken from something out there it was looking through or past the rings of Saturn and in the distance you could see planet earth just this dot the world's it's a vast universe God is focusing right now on what's happening here. He's focusing on you. You, 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 We talk about loving God. Don't forget that God loves you. Don't forget that. You want to go to heaven? I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I think you do. But God wants you there more than you want you there. Who wants you saved more than anybody? God. That's why he sent Jesus to die for you. God offers you everlasting life. Thank the Lord that God offers offers you life and that there's somebody representing you in heaven now we look beyond heaven we talk about going to heaven but what happens next second peter chapter 3 verse 13 oh this gets really exciting nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells in revelation chapter 21 god says god says well he does through john john says he saw the earth made new You read in the book of Zechariah that when Jesus comes down, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It splits wide open. It becomes a great plain for the holy city, the new Jerusalem to rest on. The earth is going to be made new and God will relocate the capital city of the universe to this earth. The scene of his greatest triumph. God sees you and he sees in you the value of the life of Jesus. That Jesus is coming back to take you to be where he is. Heaven. God's place. God wants you to be there. Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God unto the Lamb. In the middle of its street, either side of the river, was the tree of life. This is awesome. 
I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And get this, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is God's desire to dwell with his people. You know, I'm going home in a couple of days, and, and uh, I don't want you to think I, I'm already looking in the rearview mirror, but, but my point is what I know is that I'm going to dwell with my people. I'm going to be with my family. My wife will meet me at the airport. The next two people I see will be my kids, I hope. <clears throat> Can't wait. That's how God feels about you being in his presence, but, but far more intently and intensely. God is going to dwell with us. He'll wipe away all tears from our eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying. There'll be no more pain because the former things are passed away. We struggle with tragedy and loss and death and mayhem and disaster and heartbreak on this earth. But one day we'll all be behind us. This earth is Satan's best effort. It's his final shot. Soon there'll be no more devil. Look in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5. In eternity, there'll be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We'll build houses and inhabit them. It's going to be remarkable. We'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 11 and verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie with the kid, the baby goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. Verse 19, he goes on to say, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How can you be there? Through Christ, believing by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not by climbing Mount Everest. Not by swimming the widest ocean, not by winning the Nobel Prize, not by getting your doctorate in astrophysics, but by faith in Jesus. Simple. I remember living in London, uh, being in London, England, living there for a summer. I lived there longer, but this was later. Met Michael. Michael lived next door to our friends, and Michael was a philosopher. He taught philosophy at a university in one of the great cities of the world, London. It was interesting, Michael had what would amount to a terminal disease at the time. I said to Michael, so what is it with philosophy, Michael? He said, we wrestle with the great questions. Questions such as what? Questions such as, why are we here? I said, Michael, you don't know why you're here? He said, well, no, it's one of the great pursuits of philosophy to understand and answer that question. Why are we here? I said to Michael, Michael, I think I can tell you. I think I know why we're here. God created us for eternity. The, the entire point of your life on earth is preparation for heaven, to be in the presence of God. To say to Jesus, you love me enough to die for me, you can have me. Here I am. To live with God at God's place, to be there in eternity. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you stopped wondering, you started believing, I have the gift of everlasting life. Does not mean I can't walk away from it. That's another story. But I possess it now. I have it by faith. I'm not turning back. I'm not turning away by the grace of God. Don't hope. Believe. Believe. Revelation 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are they that keep his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gate into that city. Into that city. We can believe it. Follow me now. In the early 1960s, the Soviet cosmonaut traveled up into heaven. He said, he was reputed to have said, I flew up into the heavens and I did not see God. The only way you cannot see God is if you're not looking, for he's there. He will reveal himself. Young fellow I work with sends me these photos from time to time. He loves to look at space through telescopes and stuff. Sent me this amazing photograph he had taken. It was of this thing, and it had a thing around it. It was amazing. He told me what it was. I don't know. Something. And then he said to me, all the dots you see in the background, they're all galaxies. Amazing. What a vast universe. You see that, you see God. He made that. I'm looking at it, I'm saying, I don't know which direction heaven is from there, but one day I'm going up. I'm going through that. I want you to come with me. I'm going on and on and on and on. I guess I am going on, but we're going to go on through there. 
And we're not putting our feet down until they land on a sea of glass or maybe streets of gold. We are going to our father's house. The Egyptians, they built these great big pyramids. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to put our uh, dead luminaries in there and we're going to equip them for the afterlife. They gave them flowers and food and chariots and this. No, we don't need that where we're going. We are going to our father's house. We'll be in heaven soon. When Jesus comes back, the eastern sky splits wide open. Christ comes riding down the corridors of space. Gravity won't hold you down anymore. Up we go, weightlessness. And on to glory. There's a place for you. There's a place for you in God's heart. There's a place for you in God's home. There's a mansion that God would just love to go to right now. But your name on the front door. He'd love to do that. Why can't he? The only reason he wouldn't is if you say, don't do that. Don't do that. It's not a myth. It's more, I think this world is a myth. The reality is heaven. That's the reality. What a place. If you can have faith, that do you want to go? If you can have faith in Jesus, heaven is yours. God says, I'll take you. Whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. God bought your ticket already. When Jesus died on the cross... Your passage to heaven was made sure. You just got to want to go. What a day. What a day that's going to be. What a day. When Jesus, Jesus comes back. Listen, the problem with the world is it distracts us. We forget. Oh, man, my heart is strangely warmed. We're talking about the Bible. Oh, I want to go to heaven. Oh, I leave here. And oh, what's in the news? And oh, Important stuff. Got to go to work on Monday. I got to get ready for that. Oh, what are we doing? Heaven fades into the background. Tennessee Williams, the fellow who wrote A Streetcar Named Desire, wrote a little story, and it was called Something by Tolstoy. In that story, there's a fellow named Jacob. Jacob owns a bookstore. He's married to Lila. I mean, they're happy. But Lila's an artist, well, a musician, and she really wants to have a shot at the big time. And one day, someone says to her, Would you travel with us? Go on the road, sing. It'll be a big deal. Lila said, I'm going. Jacob, I'm going, but I'll be back. And Jacob said, (sighs) he gave her a key. He said, this is the key to the front door. When you come back, just let yourself in. Tell me you're here. I can't wait for you to come back. Jacob was bookish in the story. Red, 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 like a crazy man. The days turned into weeks, into months. And into years. And he felt like maybe Lila would never come back. And he just immersed himself in his own world. And one day, a key was put on the front door and the lock was turned. And a young lady, not nearly as young now, let herself in. Jacob thought it was a customer. He came out. He said, can I help you? She said, Jacob. He said, yes. Are you here for a book? She said, Jacob, what can I find you? Is there a book I can get you? She said, yes, there's a book. It's about a young couple who were married. They moved into a bookstore. His name was Jacob. Her name was Lila. She went away. He gave her a key. She came back to walk back into his life. He looked, rubbed his chin. He said, sounds like something by Tolstoy. Let me see. He went to look for the book. And she realized he just moved on. He never even recognized her. She left the store and never came back. And Jacob was none the wiser. You know what happened, right? There was distance. And that distance was allowed to grow, was allowed to get bigger, bigger, broader. Until forgetfulness had set in. Someone moved on. Jesus died on the cross, stretched out his arms. They laid his body down. He I think he positioned his hands just for them. They nailed nails through his hands, through his feet. Ah. They picked up the cross. Have you ever thought about what it felt like when they picked up the cross and dumped it in the hole? Ah. He was held to that thing by nails. The wounds must have got bigger. <clears throat> Jesus has never forgot that day. How can he? The Bible says that your neighbors are graved on a palm of his hands. Don't forget. 
Don't forget the love of God. Don't forget. Can you do something for me? Can you stand up wherever you are? It's everybody, just stand. Unless, of course, you have some medical reason why not to, then stay seated. But if you can stand, stand. You would welcome the stretch, I'm sure. But you wouldn't forget, would you? You wouldn't forget, would you? You wouldn't forget what Jesus has done for you. You wouldn't forget what God has promised you, would you? Would you? Now, some people arrived here today and they're like, me and Jesus, we're together. Others arrived thinking, I'm not sure who Jesus is. And others arrived somewhere in the middle. If you ask them, you go to heaven one day, they'd say, oh no. You don't need to leave here today saying, oh no. You can leave this place today saying, yes, because my faith is in Jesus. So I'd like to speak to your heart and ask you if today you would give your heart to Jesus. If you don't, that's between you and God. But if you do, there'll be rejoicing in heaven and rejoicing in your heart. It may be, it may be that God has been speaking to you about being baptized or rebaptized. It may be, may, maybe not. Maybe you're just a long, long, long way from God. You'd like to come back or too far from God. I don't mean this in a general way. If you arrive today and things are pretty good between you and Jesus, then I'm welcoming you to stay where you are. But if they're not, I want to invite you to come forward and commit your life to Jesus or recommit your life to Jesus. If God is calling you to give him your heart, if you'd like to become a Christian, believe in Jesus, claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then please don't wait where you are. But come and join me right down here in the front and we'll pray together and we'll commit you to Jesus. If you've wandered far from God and it's time to come back, then it's time to come back. You can do that now. Don't wait. Come to Jesus, please, just as you are. Don't wait. I have no uh, special powers of insight or discernment. But I feel in my heart that, God bless you. Maybe that's what I was feeling in my heart. I feel in my heart that somebody else is going to come down in front today. You don't have to kneel. You can stand. Don't be worried about that. Do whatever you want. But if Christ is calling you, listen, if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never taken Jesus seriously and it's time to, if in your Christian experience you've been somewhat half-hearted but you want to be whole-hearted, be, be honest, has Jesus had your whole heart until this time? If he has, thank God. If he hasn't, you can do something about that right now and surrender to him now. So I'm inviting you, God is inviting you today to pray, pray for others, maybe pray for you. But if the Lord is calling you to come and declare that He is yours and that you are a Christian, you want to grow in your faith. For some, not all, for some it'll be, I need to be baptized or rebaptized. If that's you, I invite you to come too. So listen, if it's time for you to give your life to Jesus or to be baptized or to come back to faith in Jesus because you've wandered or to give Him your heart fully for the first time, as Marion sings, God is inviting you not to wait, but come to Jesus today. Do come. Don't tarry. But for now, we want to pray. Join me in praying, please. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that you've opened the door of heaven and invited your own children to step through. We thank you. We are grateful today for Jesus, for the reality of heaven, the reality of heaven and for your call on us to yield fully, to take faith seriously, to be connected with Jesus now and forever. Listen, friend, there's still time to come, even from the back row. I'll pray long enough for you to make it here from the back. We thank you, Lord, that you would call to us. We are grateful that one day we get now to hear we are thanking you today for the reality of heaven above and for the reality of an earth that one day will be made new. We thank you that this power in your word, let your spirit speak to our hearts and bring conviction to bind up our wounds, to heal our broken hearts. And we thank you, dear Lord. You blessed us today. We've seen people unite their lives with you. We celebrate. We're grateful for each one of these who've come to Jesus today. We ask your blessing now. Keep them, keep us all. Unite us with you, with your family, with your great heart of love, that on that day when Jesus returns, we will travel through the cosmos to be with him forever.
Keep us, Father, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen, amen.